Hello, my name is Jade or Jade the Beamer and if you're new, welcome to my channel where I talk about books, poetry and writing, about TV shows, movies, board games and video games. But today I am here, kind of cosplaying, to talk to you about my favourite Harry Potter book, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. I recently reread this one because I needed some comfort and boy! It's still my favourite. Sporting the Deathly Hallows here, my Ravenclaw bow tie. I'm a Ravenclaw in case you didn't guess. Got my eyeshadow <laughs> scar and my glasses. So I'm good to go for this book beam. Also got Hermione's wand, so I'm ready. In case you don't know, Harry Potter is the best-selling book series in history. It's got seven books in it and they've all been made into spectacular movies. It basically revolves around this boy called Harry Potter who finds out he's a wizard and he goes to this wizarding school to learn about magic called Hogwarts. And he has an arch rival called Lord Voldemort who basically wants to destroy everything, like villains do. He and Harry get into conflict fuffles and it's basically about how Harry always comes out on top. Woo! This is the second book in the series and yet like I said before it's my favourite. I wouldn't necessarily say it was my favourite movie adaptation. My favourite movie would have to be Deathly Hallows Part 2, but I do think that the movie adaptation for Chamber of Secrets was fantastic. Rereading this, it was like reading the movie script. It was word for word at most points, and it was so incredible how well they did adapting it. The people who did Percy Jackson could take a leaf out of their book. I think this is the second shortest one. I believe Philosopher's Stone is a little bit shorter or Sorcerer's Stone for you Americans. Published in 1998, so it's not even that old, but it's crazy. Like, I think the statistics are like every 30 seconds someone new starts reading Harry Potter, and I joined that statistic gladly. Like I said, it's my favourite Harry Potter book of all time, so I rate it a 4.85 stars or a 92%. I'm just going to be talking about Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets today. If I think anything's relevant regarding the rest of the series or any of the later movies, I'll let you know by turning the book over so you can mute it and then come back when I turn it to the cover again. Sound good? Okay, so if you haven't picked up Harry Potter yet, please read Philosopher's Stone, it'll blow your mind, and then read Chamber of Secrets. Like I said, it's my favourite, I think it's the best. It's full of mystery and character development and wonder. There are so many fun adventures in here, there's so many cool character dynamics, we learn more about the world and magic and it expands in a terrific way. And we learn more about Harry, our main character. I also really love the cover art for my series. I often think about how my most of the book series I have, the covers don't match. Like some of them are hard covers, some of them are different editions. But I really like this one. It's the Australian version and I just like the aesthetics, like the white and then just the colours and everything. I think it really pops out. And I like that all of my books are different editions, okay? That's what makes it fun and unique. So without further ado, I'm going to be going into the spoilery review of this book. I'm going to be talking about what I love about it and the couple of things that could have been better, but I'm good with anyway. So please read it. It's, it has an amazing plot, amazing characters. I can't recommend it enough. And then come back and we can talk all about it, okay? Goodbye, people that haven't read Chamber of Secrets. Goodbye! Okay, let's talk Harry Potter. So, we automatically go into Harry's life at the Dursley's house, and might I just say, it's a handful. We start off with Vernon, who's Harry's uncle. Harry accidentally lets the word magic slip and he's like, how dare you say the M word in our house? Like it's a slur or something. And there's a line that goes, for the Dursleys, having a wizard in the family was a matter of deepest shame. And I'm like, 
They're so dramatic. <laughs> I did forget that in the books, Dudley is blonde. In the movies, he has dark hair, and I thought that was just a new way to picture him. He is such a suck-up as well. Like, Harry teases him saying things like jiggery-pokery to try and freak him out because he's scared of magic. He goes running back to Aunt Petunia, and Aunt Petunia swings a frying pan at Harry's head. I'm like, holy crap, that's like grounds for child murder. <sighs> And then when people from Vernon's work come over, some more muggles, non-magic peeps, Harry's like, I'll be in my room making no noise and pretending I'm not there. And it's just so, like, heartbreaking to see how badly they treat Harry. One of the things I don't like about Dumbledore is that he let this go on, even though we know that's for reasons. It just really sucks that Harry has to put up with this crap especially throughout his childhood. So he's sitting in his room, trying to pretend he's not there, and then something's sitting on the bed, and it's Dobby, the house elf. Dobby's one of my favourite characters in the series. I just love how helpful and friendly he is. And basically, Dobby's come there to warn Harry to not go back to Hogwarts, that there's something dangerous there and he needs to stay where he is with the Dursleys. Obviously, Harry's opposed to that. And Dobby tries to tell him as much as he can, but he's owned by a powerful wizard family, so he can't say that much. Every time he says something bad about them, he hurts himself. Oh, and Dobby, like, he doesn't need a self-harm, he's too precious. And Harry's like, okay Dobby, sit down and explain. And then Dobby's like, but Dobby has never been asked to sit down like an equal. I was like, no! So basically, Dobby tries to get Harry in trouble with the Ministry of Magic, who's like the wizarding government. And they send him a warning, they're like, you shouldn't do magic outside of school. Harry's like, well, I didn't, but okay. And the Dursies are like, hmm, so you can't use magic against us now. And Harry's like, well, so he's locked in his room, barely fed, and then Ron comes with Fred and George and they come and save him and they are so, they're such good friends and people, like Fred and George don't even sweat it, they pick his lock and they get his stuff back and they pull him out and it's all G. I really like the line that comes when um, they go back to the borough and Mrs. Weasley sees them in the flying car and it was like, even though she looked like a kind woman, she resembled a saber-toothed tiger and I was like, that's cool. The borough is very like higgledy-piggledy, it's really chaotic and it's quite small and there's so many people in it as well because the Weasleys have such a big family, it's so good. Ron shows Harry his room and he's so embarrassed, he's like, I know my house isn't that much, I'm sorry. And Harry's like, this is the best house I've ever been in. And Ron's so, like, proud and embarrassed. Ron is still my favourite character in the Harry Potter series. I just love how loyal he is to his family and how even though he doesn't come from much, he always tries to do his best. I love how he defends the people around him. I love how relatable he is. He gets angry at stuff, he's hungry, like, I can deal with that. And when they all go to Diagon Alley together, they see Lockhart in Flourish and Bot Blots. Someone sees Harry from the Daily Prophet and they, like, push past Ron to take a photo and they step on his foot and they say move aside I'm here for the daily profit step on Ron's foot and Ron's like big deal like he he doesn't let any fly and it's so good so they go through all of that and then they end up trying to go to Hogwarts together but guess what the barrier is shut at platform nine and three quarters. So Ron and Harry are stuck there. They can't get to Hogwarts. And Ron's like, well, we've got a flying car, so let's take that. So they fly across like England and get to Scotland where Hogwarts is. And it's pretty spectacular, might I say. But they run out of gas. So they like fall into this tree that's sentient and it and it attacks them called the Whomping Willow and it pummels the crap out of their car. Okay, I'm just gonna reference something that comes later in the series. I'm gonna turn this over so you can mute it and then please come back when I flip the cover background. It won't be long. So, speaking of the Whomping Willow, was that present in the Battle of Hogwarts? I vaguely remember something happening to it in the last book. Was it, like, damaged? Was it killed? Oh my gosh. Also, is this a species of tree or did someone animate it to do that? 
Okay, people, so obviously they've caused a lot of damage to the grounds and they get called into Dumbledore's office and they think they're really in trouble. And Dumbledore says gently, please explain why you did this. And I'm like, that's so refreshing. The thing I really like about Dumbledore's character is how gentle and wise he is. In the movies, it's quite a different story. I appreciate the actors in Harry Potter, but I think the first Dumbledore was a more true rendition to the book. versus the Harry did you put your name in the goblet of fire smacks McGonagall out of the way grabs Harry by the throat I also thought it was interesting how the heads of houses end up giving the punishments out like it's McGonagall's job to discipline them rather than Dumbledore himself I thought that was really interesting because it shows that he's not like a tyrannical headmaster di dishing out punishments as he sees fit he trusts the people that he's hired back to Lockhart so he ends up being the Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. Quirrell's gone after being Voldied in the last book, so we have to have somebody. He's very stuck up, he's very full of himself. He gives them a test on their first day and the questions are like, when is Gilderoy Lockhart's birthday and what would his ideal gift be? And just stuff like that. And he's a Ravenclaw. He's who we're stuck with. I get that we get other characters later in the series, but they're not major ones and I just want a like important Ravenclaw like come on it's time we got Newt in Hufflepuff we got Albus and Scorpius and Slytherin we've obviously got the gang in this series so where are the Ravenclaws at but we find out that the stuff he did in his books was a lie and he's been using memory charms to wipe people's memories and then take credit for what they did so he is clever and he is very intelligent in building his career and he goes about it in a creative way. So he is a Ravenclaw but it just sucks because <laughs> he's also a dimwit. He lets out the Cornish Pixies for some reason. He obviously doesn't know how to deal with them so why would he do that? YOLO, I'm just going to endanger all of the students. <laughs> Poor Neville is pulled by his ears up to the ceiling by these pixies and then dropped like on the floor and the chandelabra comes down after him. He is dead. <laughs> I really like the line that goes, the rest proceeded to wreck the classroom more effectively than a rampaging rhino. I was like, rhinos are my fave and this is my fave in the series. Hermione was such a strong character in this book. I really like how Gryffindor she was. People say like, oh why isn't she Ravenclaw? She's so intelligent. She knows everything. She's top of her classes. And I'm like, well she, yeah, she's smart, but She's more importantly brave. She breaks so many rules in this book and she does it for a good cause. She's muggle-born, which means she is like in the line of fire for this monster that's coming out of the Chamber of Secrets. And she needs to protect everybody. She breaks the rules, makes the apologies potion. Who gives a And she stands up to Malfoy when they find out he's the seeker. She says, well, at least no one on the Gryffindor team had to buy their way in. They got in on pure talent. She stands up to people regardless of who they are because she knows what she believes in and she's intelligent enough to fight for it. So we do find out that there's this supposed chamber of secrets in Hogwarts and someone called the heir of Slytherin is letting it out to basically kill Muggleborns and people who aren't pure blood wizards and witches. And Harry hears this disembodied voice and it goes like, let me rip you, let me kill you. And I'm like, whoa, I, I see why that wasn't in the movies. This is dark stuff. It was funny when um, Harry had to act out Lockhart's adventures at the front of the classroom and um, he had to be a vampire who hadn't been able to eat anything but lettuce since Lockhart dealt with him. That's so weird. We also get a glimpse into Ron's family so we find out about Charlie who like deals with dragons in Romania but we also find out about Bill and he's in Egypt working for Gringotts and I was like oh that's interesting because I kind of forgot what Bill did. <laughs> We get a more of a glimpse into Percy, who's like perfect, gets top grades, follows the rules no matter what. And he's a prefect, but he also has this thing on the side with Penelope Clearwater, so he's a little bit of a rebel. But he sees Ron and Harry in the um, halls, like, investigating, and he's like, no more detective work, Ron, or I'll write to mum. And I was like, ooh, pulling the mum card. We also find out that Harry's a parcel mouth, which means he can talk to snakes. 
And this is seen as a dark characteristic, like um, the Slytherins possess and other dark wizards. And it was just really harsh to see like the criticisms that he comes under for possessing this ability. The Malfoy casts that snake during dueling and it goes to attack Justin. Harry tells it to back off and suddenly everyone's like, oh my gosh, he's trying to kill Justin. There's this line that goes, any fool should have realised that Harry was only trying to protect everybody. And I'm like, that is so true. Anyone with a brain would be able to tell what he was doing. Check your biases. Uh, and Harry gets sent to Dumbledore's office and it has a griffin on the door. I'm like, ha ha, Jake. Okay, master of puns, Gryffindor. Favourite line in the book comes when people have been accusing Harry of being the heir of Slytherin and they're dodging him in the halls and the, it just talks about how Fred and George find this so funny and they like march him through the halls and they're like make way for the heir of Slytherin. Seriously evil wizard coming through. It's just so funny. The funniest line in the book for me was when um, Harry and Ron had used the Polyjuice potion to look like Crab and Goyle so they can find out more about the heir of Slytherin from Malfoy, who they suspect it is. They don't know where the Slytherin common room is, so they ask someone randomly in the hall, they're like, hey, where's our common room again? And she's like, our common room? I'm a Ravenclaw. And she just like squints at them suspiciously. I'm like, that's so funny. We also find Riddle's diary in Moaning Myrtle's bathroom. Harry's like, ooh, what's this? And Ron's like, no, you shouldn't do that. There are really dangerous wizard books, like there's one that burns your eyes out, there's one you can never stop reading, there's ones that make sure you only talk in limericks. Harry's like, well, we're never gonna know if we don't read it. Ron's like, oh, okay, I guess that makes sense. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna be talking about stuff from the rest of the series. Please mute it until I turn it back over to the cover. Okay. Okay, so after Harry finds Riddle's diary, he has a connection to it that he can't explain, even to himself. He's like, why don't I throw it out? It's just blank. It means he's a Horcrux. He didn't throw it out because he knew some of his soul was connected to it. It means something to him. And also, the similarities that he has to Tom Riddle are blatant in this book. Like, they're both orphans, they're both parcel mouse, they even look alike. It's just really cool to see, like, the parallels that JK inserted to, like, make it clear that they were connected. And so we find out that Ginny has been putting so much herself into this diary that it's making Riddle more alive. Is it possible that some, just a tiny little speck of Tom's soul is still in Ginny? Is that why Harry was attracted to her maybe? Just a theory. And also, the diary preserved Riddle's 16 year old self. Did he make it when he was 16? And also, none of the other Horcruxes sap the life from someone else in order to become, like, real. Why is that the case with Riddle's diary? And as Ginny's soul was going into it, Riddle was coming out more whole. Could he have become, like, a real person? Would Riddle have become alive? That Would there have been two Voldemorts in this world? Because we know that the raggedy old one from Philosopher's Stone is hiding somewhere in Albania. And anyone who defends Dumbledore could say, well, he wasn't too sure if there was Horcruxes or if Harry was one. But in the ending of this book, Dumbledore is explaining that when Voldemort tried to kill Harry when he was a baby, that he left part of him in Harry and that's how Harry can talk to snakes. And so Harry's like, wait, some of... Voldemort is in me. Talking about Horcruxes, Dumbledore knows exactly what's going on and he doesn't tell Harry for another four books. Are you me? Okay, back to Chamber of Secrets. So Hermione gets petrified by this monster. Everyone's been really suspicious of him, especially this Hufflepuff guy called Ernie who wasn't in the movies. And it was so nice to see him come up to Harry and apologise. He's like, I know you'd never attack Hermione, I'm really sorry, it, it's not you. And it's just like, he's nosy, but he's a Hufflepuff. So his only fears were that, like, the people around him would be hurt. And it was nice. It was nice. McGonagall addresses the whole because once Dumbledore leaves, she's the person in charge. She's like, I got some good news. And people yell out, exams are cancelled. You caught the culprit. And Wood yells out, Quidditch matches are back on. And it was just so funny. McGonagall is my favourite teacher at Hogwarts. I like that she's strict, but she has a big heart for her students. Ron and Harry have to think of an excuse so they tell her that 
they're gonna go visit Hermione and she starts crying and I'm like mm, Gonagall, I love you. Very hardcore stuff. So someone writes on the wall her skeleton will lie in the chamber forever talking about Ginny who's been taken by the monster and that is dark. Even Harry says that. He's like not with all this dark stuff going on. So we find out all along that Ginny has been controlled by Riddle through his diary and she's been the one petrifying people and controlling the the monster which is a basilisk and we find out that Tom Riddle he was the student way back when in 50 years ago it's actually Voldemort his name Tom Marvolo Riddle is a bloody anagram he says oh the people at school used to call me that and I'm like did they? Did you ask your friends to call you Lord Voldemort? Because my friends wouldn't call me Lord Jade even if I begged them to. The line that hit me the hardest in this book was when Harry's like, well, so if I'm supposed to be in Slytherin, if I talk parcel tongue like Voldemort, then why am I in Gryffindor? What separates me from Voldemort? And Dumbledore's like, it is our choices, Harry, that show what we truly are far more than our abilities. It took my breath away. It was so funny when it was Valentine's Day and that dwarf tackled Harry down the hall and sung him his Valentine. Also, Harry finds the diary and then he starts writing in it and it responds. It's a talking diary and it offers to suck you into it and show you its memories. Harry's like, yeah, sure, sounds legit. What the heck, Harry? It was really disarming when we learned that it was a Gryffindor that had snuck into Harry's dorm and stolen his diary. Wow, that was scary. Who did you guys think it was? I didn't think it was Ginny at all. It was cool when we learned more about the basilisk, how it's a chicken's egg hatched under a toad or something. Spiders are afraid of it, and the only thing that can kill it is a rooster cry, and all the roosters were killed by Ginny. We freed Dobby. Harry puts the diary in his dirty sock, and Lucius throws the sock to Dobby, and Dobby catches it, and Dobby is free. Dobby's like, you shall not harm Harry Potter. <laughs> and, and like, zaps Lucius. I'm like, yeah, Dobby. He's a hardcore little Also, with Dobby, so he was trying to warn Harry earlier, don't go back to Hogwarts, and Harry's like, does this have anything to do with you know who? Voldemort. And Dobby's like, no. And then at the end, Harry's like, what the f Dobby? It was obviously about Voldemort. And Dobby's like, well, actually, his name was Tom Riddle, so it wasn't about Voldemort, you see. I'm like, what a stupid loophole. Also, how did he know? How did Dobby know that this was about Tom Riddle? Maybe he overheard something at the Malfoy Manor, but how would any of them have known? What? That's something else that I want to know. How did Lucius Malfoy get a hold of Voldemort's Horcrux? By chance? Was he going through Voldemort's school stuff? How? The Weasleys are so mean to their owl, Errol. It's so frail and old and they just throw it around like it's a piece of garbage. I'm like, that's a living, breathing thing that's trying to give you mail. It was cool to learn about the Muggle office, Misuse of Muggle Artifacts office that Ron's dad works for. And basically it's when witches and wizards bewitch objects and then they end up being sold to like muggles and stuff and he has to sort that out because they can be dangerous. It was funny when they were denoming the Weasley's garden and they're like, get off me, and they're described as like a potato thing that they have to throw over the fence. Also, at the start, when we get to Hogwarts, there's obviously Harry and Ron as a second year Gryffindor boy. There's Dean, Seamus, and Neville. Are there only five boys, Gryffindor boys, in this year? I guess they're split over the four houses, but like that's still a really small class. At the start, we visit Gringotts and we see Harry's huge ass pile of gold. Harry looks around at the Weasleys who are poor as heck and they only have a few little silver things in their vault. And he doesn't give them any! Your best friend's family are struggling, they're giving you food and lodging, and you don't give them a penny! <laughs> what the heck, Harry? I saw this tweet or something, and Ron's like, my family's starving, Harry, with a vault of gold. Lol! Also, Hermione's parents are allowed in Diagon Alley. I don't think I ever thought about that. Like, muggles are allowed. They're in this world, just how how far can muggles go in this world? Would they be allowed in Hogwarts? 
I thought it was really cool that it was something that the movies didn't show us, just how far muggles are allowed to help her daughter out. We get introduced to Colin, who's this little muggle-born boy, and he adores Harry, which is cute, but he's so annoying. Oh, I'm so pissed off at his character. Harry wakes up, Colin's face is there. Hi, Harry! Can you tell me about everything? I love you, Harry! And he takes magical photos with his camera, which is cool. And he takes one of Lockhart and Harry together, and he looks at the photo, he's like, what? And in the photo, Harry's self is just struggling to pull away from Lockhart, and Harry's so proud of his photo self. We also learn the word mudblood, which is someone who's not a pure blood wizard, and that, it just sounds dirty, it sounds like a like a racist slur, it sounds awful. And Hermione's called that. Hermione! It was so weird that their homework is measured in length, like the length of the parchment. How weird. It just write huge, huge words. Type 100 font or something. We also get a look into strategic Hagrid, and that was one, one of my favourite parts of this book. So Lockhart visits Hagrid, and in order to get rid of him, Hagrid says, Oh, I've never read any of your books, and then Lockhart leaves, like, disgusted. And strategic Hagrid. And then when they suspect that Hagrid opened the Chamber of Secrets and they take him to Azkaban, the wizard prison, Harry and Rorna, they're under the invisibility cloak. Hagrid's like, oh, if anyone wanted to find some stuff, you, I'd just follow the spiders. And Cornelius Fudge is like, what? <laughs> and Hagrid's like, strategic Hagrid, strikes again. We find out that Filch is a squib, and a squib is someone who was born into a magical family, but has very little magical ability. That's probably why he's so salty all the time, and Harry finds his brochure and Filch is so embarrassed, and I was like, oh, little Filch? Like, we don't find about find out about squibs in the movies, I don't think. It's also cool that Professor Binns, the history of magic teacher, is a ghost. Like, he went to sleep one day, and he woke up to do his job as a teacher, and he was so determined to do it that he didn't realise he left his body behind. It seems Seems like such a Discworld thing. We also find out about Nick's death day party, and that was pretty ill. Peeves, he's a poltergeist and he's a little He wasn't in the movies, but he just causes so much havoc and he's so annoying. Whenever someone's been petrified, Harry is always there and Peeves is like, everyone come look, Harry's a murderer, there's a dead body. Hate Peeves. <laughs> My glasses keep slipping. <laughs> so we find out why Ron is afraid of spiders. It's because Fred transformed his teddy while he was holding it as a kid into a spider. And oh my gosh, I hate spiders so much. I'm so afraid of them. Look, there's one on the spine. And uh, oh, it was just so relatable. That's another reason why I like Ron. It's because he's also relatable with his fears. And there you go, and they see Aragog, and he's this giant spider surrounded by his spidey children. And I'm just like, I can't handle this, and Ron can't handle this either. Also, while Lockhart's bragging about his achievements, he talks about this charm, the homorphous charm, that turned a werewolf back into a human. How have we not heard about this at any other point in the series? How is this not a well-known cure? And it's really, the, the monster is really scary because it petrified Nick, who's a ghost, and everyone's freaking out because they're like, what can kill someone that's already dead? It was so funny when Lockhart tried to, like, heal Harry's broken arm and it just deflates like a balloon. It was so nice seeing Harry's Christmas gifts. The Dursleys send him a toothpick, but everyone gives him such thoughtful gifts and food, and it's so nice. Harry, Ron, and Hermione thinking that Draco was the heir of Slytherin was actually so on point. He's in Slytherin, his dad's in the Slytherin family, they're pure bloods. Lucius might have been able to teach Draco how to do it. Draco hates mud bloods. It just made so much sense, and I don't blame them for that theory. So Harry's stuck in the chamber, and he's bleeding out from the basilisk fang, like going into him and poisoning him. And Fox f saves the day. Fawkes blinds the basilisk, which helps because it's the basilisk's sight that kills you instantly. And he cries on Harry, and he's not poisoned anymore. I'm like, Fawkes is the MVP of this <laughs> narrative. We also learn that Hogwarts has governors. I guess they're above the headmaster because they, like, evict Dumbledore for not doing about the petrifications. And that was interesting, and how Lucius bought them off to get... Dumbledore kicked out, and Dumbledore at the end to Lucius is like, hmm, we found out that, um, they'd been blackmailed. What do you have to say about that, Lucius? 
So those are pretty much all of my thoughts about the Chamber of Secrets. It's still my favourite in the series. I love it so much. I love the mystery aspect of it. I love how the characters evolve and they're more dynamic. So many fun adventures from start to finish. With Dobby showing up in the flying car to the Chamber of Secrets and all of that mystery coming to an end. I love how passionate they are in this book, even though they're basically children. They're like 13 in this book and they're so passionate to do what's right. I like the depth that it goes into, I love the setting, of course I love Hogwarts. My letter still hasn't come, but I'm waiting for it, trust me. I only had a few drawbacks, I'm gonna turn this over to talk about one briefly, please mute it and then come back when I turn it back over. One thing that I don't like is the lack of representation and this is pretty much throughout the series. I don't see any queer people, any non-binary or transgender people, which really bothers me um, in a series that is so well loved and everyone has read. Yeah, of course, you know, we get the thing that Dumbledore is gay, but that's not really apparent. We learn about Grindelwald and Dumbledore's past in in one of the later books but again their connection isn't really shown in that way. There aren't many people from various ethnicities. I'm pretty sure the only person of colour in this book is Dean Thomas and that wasn't really pointed out. So yeah that's just something that kind of bothered me but you know I guess we have to love it for what it is and it's trying to get better. So there's that. Okay, back to some of the other things. It is dark. Um, that doesn't really bother me, but it is a kid's book. Obviously, the inclusion of spiders was a drawback for me, <laughs> but I got over it. And the only other thing I didn't like was the questions for me that weren't answered. Where did Lucius get the diary from? How did he know that Tom Riddle was in there? How did Dobby know that that all of this was to do with Tom Riddle. All of the stuff w that I said relating to the rest of the series. How did Lucius get the diary? I have all these questions, so yeah. But overall, like I said, it's still my favourite. I love it when he stabs the basilisk fang through the diary after having killed the basilisk. He obliterates Tom from existence. He is 12 and he's already done so much. Harry Potter is always has always been dear to my heart and it was just really nice rereading it and remembering why this one's my favourite. It's good. So those were all my thoughts on Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, rereading it. Thank you for going on that journey with me. If you're, if that's the first time you've read it, please let me know. If you've reread it, let me know how many times you've reread it. I think that's like my third or fourth time. Please let me know your thoughts on it. Is this your favourite in the series? Please let it be. <laughs> I don't know anyone else who has this one as their favourite. If not, which one is your favourite in the series? Who's your favourite character? Who's your favourite professor? What's your favourite quote from the Harry Potter series? I'd love to know. What house are you in? Ravenclaws, represent. Please discuss with me. My name is Jade, or Jade the Beamer. Thank you for watching my book beam. Here are all of my socials. Everything you need to know is in the description. Again, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time, you magical peeps. Expelliarmus. Please don't drop your viewing device. See you next time.